Okay. Joshua chapter 5 verse 9 I'll read one verse and the Lord said unto Joshua this day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt I took it off of you Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Verse 9. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of your last season. The Lord says unto temple of praise this day I have snatched off of you the reproach of what tried to keep you captive I read it one more time and the Lord said no longer will you have to wait today somebody shout today I have rolled away the reproach of the system of Egypt from off of you and I'll name the place Gilgal and it'll be a memoriam forever in Jesus name all of God's people said amen share this with the person beside you and be seated and we stand up again we'll just dismiss look at the person beside you tell them this is my do over season my do over season. <laughs> Anytime I, I, I preach from the Torah, it is very um, hard for me uh, to know where to start. I love uh, the scriptures, but I have a passion for these first five scrolls because it introduces to us the narrative or the historical account of God's chosen people. Now, when I say chosen, I'm not necessarily meaning special because we're all special, right? But these are God's chosen people. Chosen has more to do with responsibility than it has to do with being special. Because chosen people would have never chose it for themselves. If you're the oldest one in your family, you know, being the oldest, it's not always a, uh, a seat of bliss. Oftentimes, our parents were practicing on us. And the baby gets away with murder. I didn't come to fight with nobody. I don't want to create no enemies. And oh, bless the middle child. But the oldest. It's a complicated situation. We have a different relationship with our parents. And then at some point, we become a secondary parent to our siblings. Hmm. Them being chosen becomes very problematic in our church vernacular in what it means to be chosen. Because in our present church vernacular, favor and the chosenness of God looks like financial increase. It looks like a lot of friends. Everybody like you. Promotion large homes and nice cars and I'm not against any of those things but if you don't get a wider spectrum of the definition of chosen where they are in this text will be very problematic for you because we're looking at God's chosen people in the book of Exodus and they're in bondage mm. anointed 
but in captivity. Apostle Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from me, from the body of this death? I want you to just have a moment of honesty and transparency with the person beside you and tell them, no one has stopped me like me. Think about it. How many God moments have we talked ourselves out of? Chosen but in captivity. Got a word for everybody else and scratching your head about your next. We're all the embodiment of some sort of contradiction. We really are. We're, we all are from the pulpit to the church mothers to the door. We're all the embodiment of some sort of Lord I believe but help thou my unbelief. I got faith for you but I'm wondering, will he do it for me? Hmm. If people could read our minds, would we really even come to church? Because sometimes my quickening in, in the Holy Ghost is not because I was thinking of the goodness of Jesus. Sometimes my quickening is the Holy Ghost pulling my mind back. Okay, I'm not. Y'all don't want to be honest. <laughs> Because you're chosen and anointed, but all of us at some point have been an anointed mess. Okay, I thought y'all were gonna be the honest section with me in here. Who, who counsels the counselor? Who encourages the encourager? Who has the prophecy for the prophet? But their situation does not change their status in God. And so my conversations recently uh, due to some of the trendy topics concerning the Jewish community has been uh, very uh, diverse lately. And I'll try not to call out celebrity names and just, you know, right? Someone even mentioned to me, uh, not too long ago, says, you know, so why is it important to you that God keeps his covenant with the Jews? Because as I look at the scripture, it seems like they've been replaced with the church. And so then we go, went back and forth over this, you know, contextual conversation. I said, well, that's what the turn of the century theologians thought. It's called replacement theology that where the scriptures talk about Israel in the New Testament is really the church because there is no Israel until the 1940s of people that were not a people started getting on planes and making nomadic journeys from all the corners of the earth to come together, fulfill the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 37. That the bone, I hope I'm not boring y'all with this, that the bones that were scattered because when God speaks a thing, no matter how broke up it looks, when God speaks a thing, when people would try to replace you because it's convenient to replace you. Hallelujah. I need you to tell your neighbor, your situation doesn't intimidate God. And not only does your situation not intimidate God, your timeline doesn't intimidate God. I'm talking to about 40 of you who have almost tried to bring down what you said God said because your mindset is if it was going to happen, it would have happened by now. But I come to shout in this room that the promise still stands. Mm. So yes, I still believe that God keeps his promise with the seed of Abraham. And yes, through adoption, we are of that seed, but I, I still believe that the 144,000 is 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 from the tribe of Dan, 12,000 from the tribe of Ephraim, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah. I believe that there's 144,000 are literal descendants of those tribes. And then a number that no man could number. <laughs> 
I still believe it. Well, the conversation was, well, why is it important to you? Because I thought God divorced them and replaced them. Why is it important to you? I'm going to tell you why it's important to me. I need to know that I haven't messed up so bad that God has changed his mind. Okay. <laughs> I need to know that after all of my setbacks, I want everybody else in here to sit quiet, but somebody in here, you know what I'm talking about. I need to know that after having dotted every I and crossed every T, God still wants to use me. And so I see them. I, I see them by the mighty hand of God coming out of captivity. They came out. And they came out the same way we came out. They didn't come out because they kept the law. Because the law had not yet been given. Sinai hadn't taken place. Well, I, I, they came out the same way we came out. A lamb was slain. Blood was put on the eternal doorposts. They came out by the blood of the lamb. <laughs> and the word of their testimony. Tell your neighbor, I know how they came out. I won't there at the first Passover, but I know it was the blood. Mm. One day when I was lost, hallelujah, Jesus died. I know, I know it was the blood. See, some of you need a check in the mail to praise him, and some of you all need a new car to dance, but I'm still caught up on the cross. Uh, uh, and that, oh, when my Savior died, when my Savior, when he devoted that sacred head, for such a worm as I, I'm still caught. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but lose all their guilty stain and sinners plunge beneath death. Come on, I'm still caught. Tell your neighbor, it's the blood. It's the blood. The only reason why I'm still standing in my sanity is because of the blood. Just take five seconds with no music and just praise him for the blood. Praise him for atonement. Praise him for the sacrifice. Come on, think about it. If you had to pay for your sins, where would you be standing right now? Hey, come on. I want you to just take, I know I said five seconds, but will you take five more seconds and praise God for what the blood covered? I said praise him for what the blood covered. He didn't erase my sins. He blotted out my sins. In other words, somebody is looking there. They know something happened there, but they can't trace it because it's covered. My God, he blotted out my transgressions. Woo. Mm. They came out. They came out, but when they came out, they found themselves in the middle and tonight's text is concerning a generation that was born in the middle. Thank y'all for letting me come tonight and I'll hasten to my close. Ministry is hard. Can I just be honest about it? I love God. And I love God's people. But ministry is hard. Mm -mm. Oh, I love Jesus. But there are days that uh, the weight of the church and ministry has made me want to go join somebody else's Episcopalian church. And say, see, y'all all, all need all this. I can shout at home, see. But there are many days I said, I'm just going to join somebody's non denom One of them real big ones. Sit in the back. Come late. Leave early. Stop by the coffee shop. And because everybody can't be dealing with what I deal with. The complexities of it. I'm very ecumenical. I, I teach and preach across the denominational spectrum and, and cultural lines. And I've lifted to my, some of my colleagues, pastoring minorities, the disenfranchised, the marginalized, the economically challenged is a whole other situation. Doing ministry, doing the music ministry with the gifted is very complex. So let me say this to you pastors. 
you don't get to enjoy their gifts if you're not willing to deal with their trauma. Because the very thing and the very mechanism in them that allows them to produce the sound that you like is also the very thing in them if it ain't submitted to God will cause a mess in the house. Everybody don't have the capacity to pastor creatives. Prophets are complicated. Because they can see everything that's so far off and miss the stuff that's right up on them. We're gifted. We're anointed. But doing ministry with us is hard because we are a people that are the products of transgenerational trauma. All of us. In the world of psychology, they call it transgenerational trauma. In the sanctified Pentecostal apostolic church, we call it generational curses. In the world of psychology, they teach that it's possible for you to have fears and trauma from things you've never personally experienced. You inherited it. You were born into it. You're afraid of stuff and don't know why you're afraid of things. You don't like water and don't know why you don't like swimming. Come on. You don't like flying and you don't know why you don't like flying. It's been passed to you because it happened to them, but you're dealing with the weight of it. And the challenge with us pastoring and ministering and having church and worship with this people group it's because the people who are called to minister to them are also people that's dealing with trauma I know you judge me because you say I'm funny acting and I'm kind of standoffish at times but before you judge me Consider the fact that you may look just like the last person that stabbed me. You know, when I just nod my head and give you the courtesy, when you say, I got your back and you can trust me, yeah, the last two said that and they're not here anymore. So you're not the only one dealing with church hurt and church trauma. I'm dealing with PTSD to the fact when people join, I don't know whether to clap or wonder how long you're going to be here. So those who are dealing with PTSD are called with their own trauma to minister to the traumatized. We are wounded healers. Because we're pastoring wilderness babies. We're doing ministry with wilderness babies. We we're different than Hagar's child. And even the babies that were born by the hands of the midwives, poor and sure. We're different. Because although they had their own extreme situations, at least they knew some sense of stability. But when you were born in the wilderness, it's always changing. You never get to unpack. You never know who your real friends are. You, you'll, you'll be in a crowd of people and still feel by yourself when well, you're a wilderness baby my goodness you're, you're accustomed to watching marriages break up when well, you're a wilderness baby people saying they love you don't really mean nothing no more when well, you're a wilderness baby and people say hey doc I gotta get you to my church you're wondering what was the conversation about me before I got here when well, you're a wilderness baby you learn how to function but never settle You learn how to be present but not really a part when you're wilderness baby. When you're, when you're wilderness baby, you check out in your head and you still show up. Because this dysfunction is all I've ever known. 
This is why some people would rather stay drugged up because sobriety is too painful. And when I say drugged up, I ain't just talking about crack. I'm talking about sex. I'm talking about church because some people even use church and a praise break for sedation because you don't want to have to deal with what you need to confess. You don't want to have to deal with what you really need to face. And so we can never have a family outing. We got to have church every day of the week because we don't know who we are outside of our church titles. I don't want to have a Thanksgiving service and a Christmas service and a come on. At some point, I want to have ministry with my family. We need to normalize family worship and stop using church as an escape from our family. Oh, I'm preaching in here whether y'all like it or not. I'm preaching. Wilderness, wilderness babies. We, we don't even know. Oh yeah, my book is for sale. Thank you. We don't even know. We, we've, we've been born in dysfunction, so we normalize dysfunction. My father said something to me. He says, I was on drugs all of those years. But I did not get suicidal until I got sober. I said, what do you mean? He said, when your brother died, when your five-year-old brother got hit by a car and drugged down the street under the car because the woman thought she hit a dog. When I came to the funeral in shackles, he said, I didn't feel that because even in prison I got high. I got high before I went to the funeral and I got high when I got back to the cell. He said, but when I got sober and I realized what I had lost, when I got sober and I realized something that came from me was now dead and I wasn't in place to save it. He said, the pain of sobriety who made me want to kill myself. I need you to put your hand on your neighbor's shoulder and tell him sobriety is painful but I still want it healing is painful but I still want it deliverance is a I need you to help me here deliverance is a process but I'd rather go through the pain of deliverance than to stay in dysfunction you know what the Bible says if you want to be healed confess Y'all stop. Stop running up to people going like this. Uh-uh, no, confess. Don't run up to me speaking in tongues. We need to have a conversation. Because just because I'm silent about it does not mean I don't know what you said. But that's the dysfunction. We'll church over it. We'll dance over it. I can't trust your prophetic when you're a gossiper. Hey, I want to talk to you because I had a dream. You didn't have no dream about me. No, I don't want to hear your dreams. And we spiritualize our dysfunction. We have mislabeled church discipline and correction as jealousy. May, may we get the posture of our Messiah. When Mary said, hey, we need some wine at this wedding. He says, my time is not yet. And if almighty God can say my time is not yet, why are you mad? Because you're not being what you want to be in the time you want to be in. That's wilderness babies. Wilderness babies are looking for something to worship. Because for wilderness babies, I'm going to say this. It's complicated. I'm going to say it anyway. But for wilderness babies, God is not enough. No. 
No, I'm just satisfied with Jesus. Why are you still depressed? Why are you mad? You got him and you still upset. You still in your feelings. Because what has happened for many of us, and this is what we got to be careful about in the church. Because what has happened for many of us, many of us, we either surrendered something in the world or we were not successful in what we wanted to be in the world. So now we want to force ministry to bring value to us through the way we function in the house. So we will stab and sabotage people's character just to get to the front and get ahead. But when you know who you are in God, you don't need that one Sunday out of a week and a two hour church service to approve your value. I can be a lawyer all week and just be a greeter on Sunday. Y'all not saying that I'm in here. When you making money moves and you got multiple streams of income, I don't need to be on every committee and every board because I don't have the time for it. But I will pay my tithe. Wilderness babies. Always on the brink. Always getting ready to. Almost there. It's getting ready to happen. Mm. And I'm not going to beat you up, wilderness babies. Because the truth is, you didn't choose this position. You were born into it. All you got is the testimonies of the generation in front of, behind you. And the promise of what's supposed to come. And you are in this Eli Eli Sapakdini place. This God. I ran around the church and it still ain't happened. I mean, can y'all be honest? It's possible to do church without doing God. Because after a while, and this is why I've been telling the church, please, uh, uh, Prophet Walter, please, will you, since I am a little older than you, Will you all sanitize the prophetic, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. please. Will y'all put some holy, holy hand sanitizer please. on it? Will we stop so loosely saying God say it? Yes, now, now, I, see, I grew up in the classical Pentecostal church where in order to get a word of prophecy, you almost had to go through a trance. Yeah. To maybe come out with five words. Right. But then the charismatic movement gave us a little bit more freedom. They said, you ain't got to go through all that. Stand up and say what thus said the Lord. And I'm thankful for that freedom. But it's got to be a balance somewhere in the middle. Because now we got soothsayers. I mean prophets who got prophecies for sale. <laughs> We're using social media. God told me to tell you. God told me to tell you. If God didn't tell you, keep your mouth quiet because there's some people who have become numb to the word of God because we carried it so lightly. I, I, I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm going I'm to find out because some of y'all looking at me strange like I'm, I'm the only one that ever felt that way. Have you ever been to a place in your life that you said, I don't want nobody to call me out? I don't want nobody to give me a word of prophecy. Because for some of us, it's the prophetic that's what has really agitated us. Because of what I heard. If I had never heard it, I would have never wanted it. <sighs> and after going through a cycle, over and over and over, then the Lord says, Joshua. Joshua, after managing seasons of cycles and dysfunction. Joshua, glory be to God. After maintaining your sanity with rebellious people. And the people you've been trying to help, been trying to fight you. Joshua. Joshua. Get ready to cross over. Tell these people to sanctify themselves. Mm, hallelujah. Tell them to sanctify. Tell them, tell them I sustained them through a pandemic. Now sanctify yourself. Uh, tell them I kept them alive for such a time as this. Now sanctify yourself. Okay, we ready? We, let's go, let's go. It's getting ready to happen. Let's go. He said, no, 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 no. 
get a knife. Because when we preach about the wilderness, we go straight from the wilderness to Jericho. But there's a space between the wilderness and Jericho called Gilgal. We don't really talk about Gilgal because Gilgal is not convenient, but Gilgal is necessary. I wish I had some. I know it's Friday night. Maybe I should have preached something else. I need you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, this last season hasn't felt good, but this last season has been necessary. All right, Joshua, what's the knife for? What's... What's the knife? All right, well, you say we're getting ready to cross over. So what's the knife for? Oh, God told me, because y'all were born in this dysfunction, I can't let you go into the promise without the covenant. I need you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I don't want any more courtesy relationships. Just because we go to church together don't mean we're going to be friends. Come on. I don't need any more courtesy relationships. Your proximity to me do not determine your closeness to me. I don't need any more courtesy relationships. Just because we got the same last name don't mean we walk in the same spirit. I need you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, no more courtesy relationships. I felt the arrow of the Lord. I need 50 prophetic people to just jump up and just cast the arrow of the Lord in this room now. God just severed something. God just freed somebody up because you've been carrying the weight of obligation. You've been carrying the weight of pulling people that don't want to be pulled anymore. No more courtesy. Just because they want you to be their mentor don't mean you have to be obligated to be their mentor. Don't let people drop titles on you that obligate you. You know you're my best friend. No, I haven't known you long enough. You talk about too many people's business. I know we can't. Joshua, what's the night for? Oh, See, this is what we say in our church. We need to make a covenant. We need to make a covenant. But if you look in the Hebrew, it's not make a covenant. It's cut a covenant. That means it's not covenant until something has been cut. It ain't covenant until it costs you something. I'm trying to figure out how are you still friends with the people you said to trash me? is it that you always escape to come to tell me what they say it if we're in covenant at some point oh my god people should never feel comfortable to discuss me in your presence it ought to cost you some relationships I need you to look at your neighbor tell your neighbor I'm not perfect but tell him I'm too much of a Peter to ever be a Judas let me hear the sound of the Peters when I'm in covenant with somebody I cut your ear off when I'm in covenant with somebody I may say something and have to repent later when I'm in covenant I want you to find somebody really quickly that you're in covenant with and I want you to run to them because you're, you're getting ready to breathe life into them and I want you to tell them thank you for fighting for me. Tell them thank you. Thank you. Shut up. Even through your own trauma. Even through your own warfare. Even through your own depression. Thank you for fighting for me. When it wasn't convenient when standing beside me didn't make you look good. When defending me didn't make you sound good. Thank you for fighting. We're in covenant. Come on, tell them I got you for real. I got you covered. When you celebrated, I got you covered. 
When people talk about you, I got you covered. When I got you, got we're in covenant. And when I get blessed, you get blessed. Tell, I'm, come on, tell them I'm not jealous of you. Come on, tell them I'm not jealous of you. Point to them, tell them I want you to have everything God has for you. Shout for your neighbor now. Shout for your Before, before you cross over this joint, you need to be circumcised because you got too much flesh on you. Look at your neighbor and say, oh neighbor, this last season, God had to cut some things. I thought I was ready, but God had to cut some things. I had some friends from my past that did not make the cut. I had some relationships uh, that did not make the cut. I, I had some ideas for my own life, uh, but I had to put it on the altar. Uh, look at your neighbor, tell them, put it down uh, so God can use you. Uh, put it down so God can get the glory. I gave it up. And that's when he blessed me. Uh, he said, you got to be circumcised. Uh, but after you healed, uh, we're going over this joy. Uh, he says, sanctify yourself. Because tomorrow, uh, I'm going to do something new. Uh, tomorrow, uh, I'm going to do something great among you. Uh, look at your neighbor. Uh, said, oh, neighbor. Uh, God said, tomorrow. Uh, God said, tomorrow. Uh, and if God ever say tomorrow uh, that means uh, you can't die uh, in your today uh, I need somebody uh, to begin to testify uh, that I shall live uh, and not die uh, uh, I got a word uh, I've got to declare uh, a thousand uh, shall fall at thy side uh, and uh, 10,000 uh, at the right hand, uh, but it will not uh, come nigh thee. Uh, push your neighbor, uh, said, Oh, neighbor, live, 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 live. Hey, in a uh, this is your season. Uh, this is not the season uh, of repeats. Uh, but this is the season of the do-over. I come to prophesy to somebody who feel like you messed up the last season. I come to prophesy to somebody who feel like you missed an opportunity and you missed a door. God told me to tell you that he kept you alive for this moment. I heard... I hear Mordecai say, Esther, could it be you have been brought into the kingdom for such a time as this? Push somebody, tell him he keeps his promises. I'm alive, not because I did everything right. I'm alive, not because I've been perfect. I'm alive because his word was over my life. He said, my word, it will go out and it will not return void. It will accomplish what it was sent out to do. Announcement. Hey, announcement. The grass withers and the flowers fade. But the word, but the word, what the word. Oh, hey, the word stays. The word stays. I want you to pull on somebody and tell them you better not quit. You better not give up. This is a do-over season. When I was growing up, my mama gave me a game. It was a sketchboard where you could draw with it. Turn it on the left and turn it on the 
all right. But if you mess up, you didn't have to be stuck with what you drew. You, if you messed up, you didn't have to keep it. Tell your neighbor, you ain't got to keep it. The last season was an ugly season, but you ain't got to keep the trauma. The last season was full of pain, but you don't have to keep the pain. If you mess up, shake it up and do it over. I said do it over. Do it over. This is the season of the do-over. Good night, y'all. I've been uh, a lot of places. I've been to Latin America and preached in El Salvador. I went to South America and preached in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. I left South America and went to the continent of Africa and I preached in Cape Town and Johannesburg. I flew north and went to Nairobi, Nairobi, Kenya, went over to Europe and stood in London, Walthamstow, Birmingham. Oh my God, I left there. I've been to Beijing. I took a flight from Beijing and went to Mongolia. I've been a lot of places and I've seen a lot of things, but there's one thing I haven't seen. I've never seen the righteous for sure. This is what God said, I'm going to do. You've been covered up in the layers. Some things you put on yourself, but some things you were born into. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, I didn't choose all of this. And don't tell me I didn't pray hard enough. Because I prayed about it when you didn't know about it. Don't tell me I didn't read enough. Don't tell me I ain't never fasted. There's some things that the Bible says manifold challenges for a season. In other words, Isha. In other words, there's a timing on it. Husha. Honey, to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I feel the expiration date close. Something you've been dealing with for a long time. I feel God is about to pull it off for you in a short time. I need somebody to praise God because your expiration, I can feel it in I can feel it in the Lord of I can hear He said, Joshua, what I'm about to do, I'm going to peel off of you all the layers, all the stuff you've been wrapped in. I am removing the reproach, the death, the trauma, the pain of your last season. You've been ministering bound up. You've been worshiping in captivity, but get ready to worship deliver. Get ready to worship free. Somebody start leaping right now because you're getting ready to leap into another. You're getting ready to leap into another season. Do it. 
You ain't got to settle for it. In the middle of a famine, the king heard two women fighting. Come on, y'all Bible readers. Two women were fighting over a baby. And the king said, what's going on? King said, we ate one baby yesterday. And we're supposed to eat the next one today. And now the other mother is pulling out. And the king says, I got to find out whose baby is it. That was under the family. Then this was a time under Solomon where one suffocated that baby in the sleep. And the king says, I got to find out whose, whose baby is it. I want you to testify to somebody, tell them the dead baby is not mine. My promise is still alive. I've gone through setback after setback, but I refuse to hold on to dead works and dead promises. I believe. I believe. I believe. This is going to be a do over. This is going to. I'm, I'm gonna tell you why this is important. I'm gonna tell you why this word was so important. Because this generation was born in the wilderness because a generation birthed them in the wilderness. I'm gonna tell y'all why this is important. Because God says the reason why your warfare has been so strong is because this next move you're about to make in the spirit it's going to affect the next three generations of your family. I'm not telling you your children are not going to have a fight. I'm telling you they're not going to have your same fight. Right, I'm going to give y'all. I'm going to give y'all a moment. Tell somebody, give me some space. I'm going to say this to you in this room. Don't you sit and eavesdrop on this prophecy and go through the motion of church. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, my last name is connected to this. This next move you're about to make in the spirit, some of you, is going to bring deliverance to your siblings. Oh my God. I'm about to give I'm just giving y'all a chance I'm going to need at least In a moment I'm going to need at least 10 runners Because those 10 people who run You're going to be declaring That for your whole family They're going to outrun The thing that had plagued your bloodline For generations Tell your neighbor I refuse to lose another family member to the devil when I count to three I see some people that already grabbed it when I count to three I don't want you to give a cute praise I want you to praise God like the whole trajectory of your bloodline is connected to this praise look at your neighbor tell your neighbor this is not just a do-over for me but tell them my siblings, come on, tell them my children, my nieces, my nephews. I even feel a praise to go forth for our first cousins. I'm going to break this thing finally. This spirit of adultery that's been in my bloodline and divorce, I'm going to break this thing. Shut the spirit of drug addiction and alcoholism even the spirit of mental illness in my bloodline when I count to three I want you to break it now come on come on one two three break 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 it one 
I want you to turn the trombone up in the house. I need to hear the sound of deliverance. Oh. My, my, my. I said break it for your family. Break. Come on. Break it for your family. Break it. This is a duo with C. This is a duo. Prophesy with your feet. Come on, I like loud church. Clap your hands. Come on, play the organ. Let's go. Come on. Listen, listen. Who you're standing beside may not be your friend. Will you go lean close to somebody that you know? Will you just go grab somebody you know and just, just get beside them? Because what God is doing for us tonight is corporate. It's corporate. It's corporate. I want you to look at them and tell them I got good news for you. Tell them this is very good news. Tell them the season you just came out of, you will never have to repeat it again. Oh, shut You will never have to repeat it. Somebody run down here to this altar and put a praise on it. Put, put, put a praise. Put a praise on it. You will never have to repeat it again. Oh. I said you'll never. This poor man cried. Hey, this is Bishop S.Y. Younger. Thank you for watching this video. And now what I need you to do is like and subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can continue to get more inspirational, motivational, and gospel content in your direction.